Bible says in Ecclesiastes, for they accomplish more than being alone. That's why we have to work as a team. You will become an excellent and effective leader when you begin to realize that leadership is not an option. You have to know the career of your calling. I love you, but I ain't come to celebrate you. I can't celebrate you. Now, when you have a birthday party or anniversary, something like that, we, we keep your car, a couple dollars, whatever, but, right? Well, welcome to Oasis Church International, everybody. Hallelujah. Amen. Place where we build in the kingdom, man. Day by day, by faith. I said by faith. Amen. Everything's by faith. Amen. Everything's by faith. And we have to continue to, <laughs> we have to press in. I heard a word recently. And it came from a child. It was online, and it was it was it was a it was a meeting, and it was a some of the youth and kid was being a kid playing around in church, and the Holy Spirit got a hold of him. <laughs> Amen. In a good way. You, you know, one of them things like you've heard people say. You know, I went to church. I didn't go looking for anything, and something happened. Well, that's what, that's what happened to that kid. And to listen at that kid's testimony tells you, amen, that God has us in the palm of his hand. I don't care how bad it looked, because the devil, he'll do everything he can to make you think it's over, it's done, you're through, but God is in control. He, he's in, he, he really is, but the enemy will do everything he can to make you think that he's not, and that you and I, we're helpless. Might as well give up, man. Throw in the towel, but my Bible tells me something different. Just like that kid, he's standing there, and he's giving his testimony about what happened how he was playing around in church, him and his friends. And then all of a sudden, you start seeing the events start to happen and things start to take place. And I ain't going to go through everything that he said, but he started seeing visions and he didn't understand some of them, but he saw this one vision and, and he says, I saw this man and the man was in a blue suit and, and uh, he started crying. He could barely get it out. And then he, 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 he was saying, and uh, he, was, he was teaching he was teaching some kids, and they was all sitting there, and they was all reading the Bible, and then he started crying again. And then they said, well, who was the man? Who was the man? And he said, the man was me. <laughs> now he's an adult, and he's a preacher, and them kids was his, and God allowed him to see where he was taking them at. Now, this is the same kid that's in church cutting up. So, again, sometimes we look at our kids and we look at circumstances and situations and it looks like it's hopeless and helpless, and, but God is in control. Yes. Amen. I said he's in control. Amen. Amen. So, I want to this morning spend a little time helping you out, helping myself and you out. Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. We want to look at something, man. This is it's eye-opening, even though I know you know it already, but there's something about it that ought to get your attention when it's attached to a couple of other scriptures. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Bible says, watch this. There is, therefore, now. Say now. No condemnation. None whatsoever. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, condemnation 
is something that the enemy, if you don't know no better, the enemy will do everything he can to make you feel guilty about something that the Lord has already paid the price for. Now, please hear me. It's not that you didn't do it. Look at your neighbor and say, you did it. So it ain't, it, it's not that you didn't do it. No, 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 you did it. But the Lord paid for it. I, I need that to sink in. No, you actually did it. I did it. We did it. But the Lord paid for it. So the scripture says there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. There is no guilt. You and I have been delivered from guilt. We've been delivered from shame. But the devil don't want you to know it. Because if he can keep you and I feeling guilty, we are actually sin conscious. And the Bible tells us, in Hebrews especially, God doesn't want us to be sin conscious. He wants us to be forgiveness conscious. Not sin conscious. What was the purpose of Jesus going to the cross if you and I were still going to be conscious of our sin? No, he don't want you sin conscious. He wants you forgiveness conscious. Now, I, I guess I probably ought to, I don't even have this written down. Put, put Romans 8 and 1 up in the NLT. I, I want to look at it in the NLT. And then I'm going to show you something that's real interesting that I just, mm -mm -mm. It says, watch this, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. <laughs> belong to Christ Jesus. See, there got to be something about you and I that the devil understands that a lot of us don't understand. Because he's constantly trying to make you think that you don't belong to Christ Jesus. He's constantly trying to make you think that you're out there on your own. So there got to be something he's afraid of. There's something that he is afraid of, which is why he constantly wants you and I to think your sins are not forgiven. Now, I'm talking to you if you're a born-again believer. Because, yes, it's a process that we have to go by. Yeah, we have to give our lives to Christ because Jesus is the one that paid the price, huh, in full for our sins. The Bible tells us real clearly, Jesus, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So there was a price paid for your freedom. I said there was a price paid for your freedom. There was a price paid for my freedom. Huh? Now, I think last week maybe I said something and the Holy Spirit reminded me of it just now. The Bible says that he was delivered, offered up for your sins, my sins, your sins. But the Bible says he was raised for our justification. And last week, this is kind of a continuation, last week what we found out was that that was the receipt, a divine receipt that the price for our justification, our justification was paid in full. I asked the question last week. Let's say, for instance, you know, we as Americans, we like to work hard and to try to own stuff. Huh? We want, we want to own stuff. We, we, we buy a car, we feel good when we finally make the last payment and we now own it. 
we, come on, man, we got the title. You buy a house and you finally make that last. I mean, come on, man, we get a stream about this stuff. We, they have ceremony. They be burning up the mortgage papers and all kinds of stuff. Am I telling the truth? So it must be a big deal, right, to own something. Is that right? See? So I asked the question last week. I said, so if you have bought a suit, they gave you a receipt. And that receipt represented proof that you purchased that suit from that place on whatever date, and that was the cost of it. The receipt was proof. But you can't change the receipt because the receipt represents a value. So it's not the receipt. The receipt is not what paid the cost. The receipt is proof that the cost was paid. So he was raised for our justification. That's your divine receipt that the cost for your freedom is paid in full. Why is that important, Pastor? Because the devil is always trying to make you think there's still something left for you to do. He's always trying to make you think there's still something you have to do in order for you to be made right with God, which technically what he's doing is putting you back underneath another covenant, putting you back underneath the law, where you do good to get good. So if you don't know no better, and you don't understand the word, then you'll find yourself not in Romans 8 and 1 we just read, where there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus or those of us that's in Christ Jesus, no, You'll find yourself in another boat where there you're feeling condemned. And condemnation is the root cause of a lot of our problems. Fear comes from condemnation. Now, many of you remember the story of a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. Everybody with me? The Bible says she was caught in the very act. Huh? So she was committing adultery and was caught, but the Pharisees, the religious folks, at the time, they literally drug her to Jesus, and they were trying to trap him. And they asked, they said, this is what the law of Moses say ought to happen to her. What do you say, teacher? You remember the story? And then Jesus stooped down and started writing in the dirt. Actually, he was writing on cobblestone if you really study that out. Why is that important? When the law was written, with the finger of God, what was it written on? Stone. I'm going to leave that alone. That's another sermon. All right, so he stooped down and started writing. And he told them, he says, watch this. He that's without sin. Let him cast the first stone. And the Bible said, they began to leave out one by one, from the oldest to the youngest. And I remember teaching you this before, you might have forgot. But the Bible says, he raised himself up, and he looked around, and everybody was gone, and he asked the woman, woman, where are thine accusers of yours? Does not anyone condemn you? And she says, no, my Lord, and this is what I need you to get. And he says, Neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Amen. Why is that so important? Because he just gave her the gift of no condemnation. Now, now, hear what I'm getting ready to say. Out of all them people that was there accusing her, 
that drug her there and throw her down in front of the feet of Jesus and said, the law of Moses says she should be stoned. What do you say? And Jesus put him in a situation because he says, let him that's without sin cast the first stone. He didn't say she wasn't supposed to be stoned. That is not what he said. No, no, no. He said, let me give you the honor, though. If you without sin, you be the first one to throw one. And the truth is, there was nobody there without sin but him. They would if they could, but they couldn't. He could if he would, but he wouldn't. If they could have did it, they would have did it. But they didn't, they didn't, none of them meet the criteria. None of them was without sin. So they, they, if they, if, if, if they could have did it, they would, but they couldn't. He was without sin, the only one. But he wouldn't. You say, well, pastor, that's great. But I, you said that's going to be tied to another scripture. Show me. I'm glad you asked that question. We're going to Leviticus for the next five minutes. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 4, and I need you to put it up in the NLT because I know I'm going to run out of time. So I got to go straight to it. Leviticus 6 and 4. Now, you might not realize it, but I'm preparing you to worship in giving. Because I know the greatest givers, according to Scripture, he, watch this, he who is forgiven much, loves much. So that means if I can convince you through the Scriptures and show you at least one act of his love towards you, you'll be even freer whenever we worship in our giving in just a few minutes. Because you understanding his love for you, remember, it's not about you loving him, it's about him loving you. Not that we love God, but that he first loved us. You know, you can actually put people under the law when you ask them that question if they don't know the Scripture. You know, because the law, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, so it, that, that's actually in the law. You know that, right? Because he knew you couldn't do it. I said he knew you couldn't do it. He wanted, that's what the law was supposed to do. The law was supposed to show you how far away from a holy God you really were. And then Jesus, at the appointed time, would show up and do for you what you couldn't do for yourself. He says, now, I know you can't love me with all your heart, mind, and soul, but watch me. I'm going to come and love you like that, and I'm going to be your example. You understand what I'm saying? Leviticus, where is it at? They ain't got it up there yet? Six? Yes? Watch this. Now, remember we was talking about condemnation, Romans 8 and 1. If you do your word study, you'll find out that that word is associated with guilt. Somebody say guilt. You might not have been to court, but I know you've seen it on TV at least. People go to court, and they got a judge, they got a jury, they got a prosecuting attorney. You know the Bible is kind of set up like that, right? You do understand that. Who's the righteous judge? God the Father. He's the righteous judge. Huh? He, who is the accuser of the brethren? <laughs> Find yourself in court, and whoever's sitting on the other side of the aisle, okay, yeah. Uh, somebody, trying, somebody trying to get you convicted. Now, so guilt is what the, in court they're trying to prove whether or not you're guilty. Once again, you don't, you don't need to raise your hands. Pastor, I've been to court. I don't need to know that. But one of the first things they do is they read what you did and what you've been accused of. And then they ask you, how do you plead? Yeah. 
Now, don't try to be religious on me and say, I plead the blood. Because you know, matter of fact, I wish you'd go in court and say, I plead the blood, Your Honor. Click up, click up. I can see you getting dragged out of court right now. What they call it, they put you in uh, contempt. You're trying to be funny. That's what the judge said. Oh, you, yo, you wise guy, huh? <laughs> put you in contempt of court. But they ask you how you plead. Guilty or not guilty. So now, I had them put this up in the NLT because it translated the words already for you. you. Got me? It says, watch this now. Now, hey, where we at? Leviticus. That means we in the Old Testament, right or wrong. Hmm? Okay, watch this. It says, verse 6, as a guilt offering, say guilt offering, to the Lord, you must bring to the priest your own ram with no defects. Say no defects. Or you may buy one of equal value. So in other words, you bring in a ram that has no defects. Hmm? I got to make sure you're in the right place. Six and four. Verse four. I knew something in a little bit. All right, here we go. If you have sinned in any of these ways, you are guilty. Stop. See, I needed to get to the point where you can't get out of this. <laughs> Remember earlier I said, look at your neighbor and say, I did it. You did it. Now you did it. You, now you did it. The Bible say you did it. You don't even know me, sir. I ain't got to know you, but I know you did it. Because the Bible say you did it. I did it. You did it. We did it. So let, we, we got to get past that first. Because you can sit up there and keep saying you didn't do it. But if God, the righteous judge say you did it, you did it. He says, so if you have sinned in any of these ways, you are guilty. Now I ain't going to tell you what you got to do. Watch this. <laughs> you must give back whatever you stole or the money you took by extortion or the security deposit or the lost property you found. What do you mean lost property I found? I found it. Huh? Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. That your law. That ain't what God say. You can't find a man wallet out there in the parking lot. And it big got a big old ID card in there. I drive a license, tell you exactly who he is, where you live at. And you gonna keep the $40 that's in there. And then turn the wallet in with no money in it. But they ain't like it that. <laughs> Messing up my stuff. That's why you gotta know what the Bible says. Because people will tell you, you ain't did nothing wrong. You ain't steal it. Yeah, you did. They call that stealing in the Bible. So it said if you did any of that, any of it, the money you took by extortion or the security deposit or the lost property you found, verse 5, or anything obtained by swearing falsely, meaning lying, Swearing falsely. Joker stand in the courtroom with one hand on the Bible and another one raised in the air and lie like a rug. Swearing falsely. Huh? Oh, no, I swear, I swear on my mama grave. They say all kinds of stuff. No, they lie. No, no. He says swearing falsely. Then he says, what you got to do? Mm-hmm. You must make restitution by paying the full price, say full price, plus an additional 20% to the person you have harmed. On the same day, you must present a guilt offering. That's the guilt offering. Now, 
What's the good news in this? I'm glad you asked that question. Psalm 69 and 4. And I'm going to uh, ask you to put that other in NLT also. Psalm 69 and 4. Full value plus 20%. My math tells me that's 120% that you have to pay back. So if you took something wrongly, any one of them sins, you have to bring a ram without blemish. It's a guilt offering. Can't be nothing wrong with it. You got to restore to that person that you injured or you stole from 100%. It's full value, that would be 100%, plus an additional 20%. That's 120%. So if you stole something from your brother, you got to repay it 120%. Need a calculator? Now watch this, watch this. Psalm 69 and 4. I ain't got time to go through all of this. I just want to go through enough of this so that you don't feel guilty no more. The Bible says, those who hate me without cause outnumber the hairs on my head. Those who hate me without cause, they don't have a reason to hate me, they hate me without cause. Put up the next part. That's just part eight of this. It says, watch this. Many enemies tried to destroy me with lies. Put up the next part. Demanding that I give back what I didn't steal. Demanding that I give back what I didn't steal. Jesus says, I didn't take it, but I must restore. Now, real quick. New King James Version, same scripture. Please, got to go quick. I'm out of time. It says, those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Next part. They are mighty who will destroy me. Next part. Being my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. Jesus said, I didn't take it but I must restore it. Now, you took it, you did it, I did it, we did it, but Jesus says, I didn't do it, but I must restore. In other words, the price was paid, there is therefore now no condemnation, no guilt, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus went and paid the price to restore you and me. Listen, he restored back to the Father what was taken. He restored back to the Father everything that was wrongfully taken. Even though he, wasn't, he was not the one that did it, he says, I still must restore. So he returned back to the Father. Watch this now. He returned back to the Father everything that was tooken, taken, plus 20%, remember? Full value plus 20%. So how does that help you? First of all, it gets you off the hook. Second of all, is there anybody in here that have not had anything taken from them ever before? Yeah, you have, and I know you have. Okay. Well, even though the devil have lied to a whole lot of Christians and told you God was the one did it, according to the scripture I just read, he says, I didn't steal it, but I must restore. Jesus ain't the one that took it. God ain't the one that took it, but Jesus was the one that came to restore it. So tell me whatever it is the devil has taken from you. Jesus came to give it back full value plus 20%, which is 120% restoration. Honey, it might be your health. It might be your children. It might be your marriage. It might be your finances. I don't know what it is, but he says, I came to give back full value plus 20%. He says, I didn't take it, but I must restore I 
I told you I was just going to give you something to make you want to give. Because when you understand how much has been given for you, the price that was paid for you, huh? He who's forgiven much loves much. When you start, and that's why I say, Pastor Gabe, a lot of times people, they don't understand believers. They mean well, but they don't really understand the price that was paid. And therefore, they, they worship based off what they understand. <clears throat> See, and, and, and that worship, you shortchanging because God is so much better a lot of times than what you understand. And that's why it's so important we in church and we hear the truth so that we understand what the price, the price that was paid and how valuable it was. So I can look at my life, I don't know about you, and I can see a whole lot of stuff now that I know what the Bible say, and I realize it wasn't God that did that to me. It wasn't God that took those things from me. Hmm? Even, remember I had you earlier do the exercise where you look at your name and say, I did it? No, no, no. Even the stuff that you did. How many of you have been tricked before? If you didn't raise your hand, you just got tricked in. <laughs> you got tricked in. Everybody in this room been tricked before. It's called deception. And the devil is the master deceiver. I didn't take it, but I must restore. 120% restoration, much more. That's the God we serve. Amen. And he wants you restored 120% in every area, every area of your life. God wants you restored 120%. And Jesus came to pay that price that you and I could not pay in order for you to get that 120% restoration. New Testament, you keep seeing that verbiage much more. That's what the much more is. It's not just what was taken. It's the 20% over the top. Amen? He can't stand it. He thought he had you. Huh? He thought you would be deceived by misery. No, uh-uh, no. I read the end of the book. I believe you did too. I read the end of the book, man. Huh? We sung the song earlier. Didn't we sing the song earlier? Huh? Where's the victory at? It's in Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Don't let the devil trick you. Amen. Just in case you're not truly convinced yet, there's a man of God that's going to help you get more convinced of the truth. Help me welcome our man of God, Bishop Dr. Wayne Babb. Come on. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Clap your hands, all ye people. Make a joyful noise unto our God. We worship him because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Now we say, we, we always say that he deserves our worship, but it is true. It's not a cliche. You get what you receive from God because you know how to worship Him. Yeah. Worship is bowing the knees and praise is lifting the hands. We bow our knees before Him. We say, Lord, we welcome you in this house. We've come to worship you. Would you lift those hands towards heaven for a moment? It says you love your neighbor as you love yourself. We share the love of God because we have His love by the Holy Spirit that's, get, that's placed into our hearts. We're family. You might not like me, but you got to love me. Come on now. We, he, we love the Lord <laughs> because He first loved us. And He said He's given us His love and He's given us His righteousness. You know, you're going to be attacked by those who don't understand you. The moment you make a decision to follow after God, hard after God, you're going to turn some people off. Are you listening to me? The very ones who accommodated you and loved you and talked well about you. See, we have to love the things that God loves, and we hate the things that He hates. And we cannot compromise the Word of God. It is the only source of change that can happen, not just in our nation, but in each and every one of our individual lives. It's the only thing that can change a man, change a woman. Not from one gender to the other. <laughs> 
but he changes you from death to life. He said the life, the Bible says that God have life in him and he's given his son to have life in himself. He said they that have the son have life. They that have not the son doesn't have any life. And we found out that life, the eternal life, is the quality of life that lasts you until eternity. So when the Bible says everlasting life, it begins, we have a present possession of everlasting life. It doesn't happen when you die. It starts the day you say yes. These children need to know this. The day they say yes to Jesus, everlasting life began. Because it's not about time. It's not about distance and time. It's about quality. And that's what that word means. Everlasting life, that phrase, is the quality of life that God gives us that lasts forever. Just because it's so great a life that God's given unto us. Amen? I said amen. So don't worry about what people say about you. Stand your ground. Say what God says. And God will defend you. We don't have to defend God. God will defend you. He'll defend me. We just keep saying what he says. In the face of a corrupt, evil, wicked world, we're going to stand firm. See, the day is coming when you're going to have to make that confession. When you're going to have to make that confession in the face of danger. And sometimes even the face of death or life. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to say, I don't care what you do. Me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. So if you're going to kill me, go ahead and kill me. I'm be better off. Paul said it's far better. He didn't say it was better. He said it's far better to be with the Lord. But we're not going anywhere. We've got to testify of the goodness of God. We've got to declare his goodness to the world and let them know that the word is still true. It's everlasting. I said it's everlasting. Psalms, now, now let's, let's, let's go ahead and read that psalm, the hundredth psalm. We're going to read it together. Come on. We're going to read that together. See, I, I, we read this because we get to that last phrase where it says, His word is everlasting, endorsed to all generation. I want us to read it because, you know, you have to confess the word because you, you'll never possess what you can't confess. And you have to constantly confess means to agree with. Everybody say agree with. You know that's what confess means. To say the same thing and to agree with. So we're not going to agree with what they say. We'll agree with what he says. And so here's, here's uh, the, the psalmist David is making such a declaration when he said, we'll bless the Lord. Our soul. Everybody say my soul. That's your mind, your emotion, and your will. When we say we bless the Lord, our soul bless the Lord, we give him all of us, all of who you are. So Psalms, the hundredth Psalm, the hundredth Psalm, and beginning in that first verse, let's read it together. Can you put that up there? And we'll read it, and we're reading it together from the New King James. Uh, uh, we have, okay. Are you ready? One, two, three, read. Make a joyful shout unto the Lord all ye lands serve the Lord with gladness come before his presence with singing know that the Lord he is God it is he who has made us and not we ourselves and the sheep of his pasture enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise be thankful to him and bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. Shout hallelujah, somebody. His truth endures to all, all generations. Oh, it doesn't change doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. 
What does that mean? It means that you can count on him. He said, he said he'll never disappoint them that put their trust in him. How many of you trust the Lord this morning? I'm going to turn to the scriptures. I know I don't have much time left. Somebody says, well, what does that mean? <laughs> no, seriously, we don't, we don't take a whole lot of time because I, I just believe in my spirit that God wants us to pray for those who need prayer this morning. And, and, and we won't be long. We're just going to go right to it and believe God to restore your health. It's one thing to ask for divine healing, but it's another thing to live in divine health. Are you listening? I was talking, how many of you remember uh, Sabata? Or Sabata is how they pronounce it in, in uh, Botswana. Come on, let me see your hand. You remember? All right. She hadn't been with us for several, we, just, we spoke on the phone yesterday for a while, and so there's going to be a, a reconnection. But um, she was telling me that in the, in the church there at, in Botswana, there's so many people that are moving, just moving from one place to the next, jumping from church to church because they're looking for miracles. They want signs. They want prophecy. But she said to me, she says, I remember everything that you have taught us. And we're staying focused on the Word of God. And we will keep preaching and teaching the Word as a result, she said, our church is growing. Hallelujah. God is moving. Says great things are happening. And so petition to come and just to, to revisit and bless the people. So, I, you know, when I heard that, I thought, dear Lord, you know, what's interesting about this is that, you know, when, when people get healed, you notice, notice, those who run after miracles, run after healing, they don't keep it very long. Now, wait a minute. Go do your research. You'd find the people who, who's running after healing and miracles, when they get it, they don't keep it. Don't shout me down. Don't look like it. And you say, why is that? Because they don't. Is the word is what keeps you. Not the healing, not the miracles. The, see, the word is what brings the miracles. Is The word is what brings the healing. So if you don't have the word, you'll lose your healing. And you can lose your miracle. And you know what happens? You come right back in line to get another one. And then when that's over, you come back in line the next time to get another one. And it constantly, no, no, when you get the word. That's why the Bible said, whom the Son makes free is free indeed. And the Scripture teaches us, it teaches us that when God gives you something, it's permanent. But it takes his word to keep it. Because you've got to have a revelation of his word to keep what God gives you. So I was very, very impressed with her and what the ministry there is doing. And I thought that was that just a great, great testimony. Great testimony. You don't want to lose what God gave you. The word is what's going to help you keep it. Because it is the word that's everlasting, by the way. He said, everything will pass away, but not one jot or tittle of my word will pass away. That lasts forever. Won't you like to ride on something that lasts forever? Well, by the way, that's the word of God. So I'm just going to take a few moments, because I believe there's, there's some of you in here uh, this morning that needs a touch from God. You know, we, last week when, when the children were baptized and we talked about baptism, but there in Hebrews, the, 11, the 6th chapter, where it talks about these, the elementary principles, the doctrine of Christ. One of the doctrines of Christ was laying on of hands. And I know much of the church had denied that and say that is not for today. That was back in the apostles' days. But the same is true today as it was then, because the word never changes. Because he said, you that believe will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It is not up to us to recover you. It is up to God. It's up to us to do what he says, and then the rest of it belongs to God. But then 
It is depending on your faith. Do you believe it or don't you believe it? The reason I say this is because God just directed me this morning as I came to the office, and I just read a couple of passages to you to give you some good understanding of how you can, how you can get Jesus or get the Lord to respond to you immediately and how, how you can get your healing, and then you have to learn how to keep it through the Word of God. See? Amen? So I just had a couple of examples. Uh, 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 as we read in Matthew, the 16th chapter, Matthew and 16, you, everyone knows this story in verse, beginning in verse 21. It says, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And it says, And behold, a woman. You know this. We know this, right? Don't, don't turn it off. Don't get turned off because you know the story. Because you start listening to it again and you just get some insight that you haven't seen before. Revelation says what? And behold, a woman, a woman of what? Of Canaan. Remember, Canaan is not covenant people. What they call them half Jews. They're not covenant people. The Canaanites. You remember the Canaanites in the Old Testament? This, this is the descendants of the Canaanites. So, see, he said, a woman of Canaan had nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do with the children of Israel. He said, a woman of Canaan did what? Came from that region and did what? And cried out to him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord. Notice, notice she called him Lord, right? She's not, a, she's not a covenant Jew. She said, O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. And verse 23 says, but he answered her not a word. In other words, what does that mean? It means he ignored her. Look up here. Everybody look up here for a moment. Imagine, here's somebody requesting something from Jesus, and he absolutely ignored her. He never responded, didn't say a word to her. How'd you like that to happen to you? Seriously, how'd you like that to happen to you? I mean, you got a problem when you ask me something and I ignore you. Could you imagine? I don't, I don't take, make it a habit of ignoring anybody. If somebody told you that, tell them it's a lie. He said, let's go back, let's go back. He said, he answered her, cried out to him, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my, my daughter is uh, severely demon-possessed. Verse 23, once again. But he answered her, not a word. That's important to underline that phrase, not a word. He says, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she cries out after us. Why does they say this? Because she's, she's not a covenant, not a Jew. Send her away. Verse 24. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm not here for her or them. I'm here for the lost sheep of Israel. I'm here for the Jews. And verse 25, 20, 25. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Verse 26. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dog. That's some harsh words, isn't it? It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dog. And she said, But yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumb which fall from their master's table. She not only called him Lord, she's calling him master. What does master mean? Owner. And verse 28, then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. How in the world did she get him to change his mind? How did she get him to change his mind when he says, healing is the children's bread? This belonged to the children. Hmm? How did he get her to change? How did she get him to change his mind and gave her what she requested? 
Well, you know, I've taught on this before in a, on a different subject, but the answer is right in, you, in our face, right there. Hmm. The answer is in verse 25. Remember now, Jesus ignored her the first time she approached him, and now she came back and approached him again. But in verse 25 it says, then she came and did what? She came and did what? She came and did what? She came and worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. And the moment she worshipped him, she got his attention. My God. Now some of you, now you, is it hitting you the same way that it did the first time you heard it? Well, yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's insight. She worshipped him and said, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread. And she said, but yes, Lord, even the, the, the dogs eat the crumbs. And then Jesus answered and said to her, Lord, listen, you, you, you went beyond. That's enough. Let it be done according to your faith. And so the key to her miracle for her daughter was the fact that she worshipped him. What does that mean? It means that she approached him the correct way. So if you want to get something from God, you've got to approach him correctly. If he's king of kings, if he's your king, you don't jump before royalty or the throne and demand or request anything. You need the scepter of righteousness. You need a welcome. If he is king of kings, we have to approach him the right way. Now, I told you the story before. I've been in countries and still, even uh, recently, that they still have uh, monarchies where there's one person ruling, a king. And, and we're told that if you're going to come, I've, in fact, one time I've been invited to go before the king just to, to meet because I knew, his, um, I knew his daughter's husband and they, she was at the same church, and they invited me, but we never get to go see him. But then they, they give you, they instruct you before you go there, this is how you enter that, the throne room. It says, you don't, you don't just walk in there, and you've got to make sure that you're dressed correctly. You can't come in there with jeans, cut off jeans and hole in your jeans and T-shirts. It says, you dress correctly. But here it is, here's, a, here's an earthly king. It says, when, when they approach him, they get on their fours. They come in on all fours until he says, rise. Till he gives them a nod so they can stand before him. Because they're entering a place of royalty. Well, if they can do that for a natural, for an earthly king. See, that enter on fours is a, is a form of worship. Because they're not worshiping him as Lord, but they recognize the royalty. If you can do that for an earthly king. So we enter, we enter and just demand things from God. God, I need this. God, I want this. You know, when, when Jesus taught them to pray, he didn't ask for daily bread at the beginning. He didn't say, ask the Lord, Father, Give us this day our daily bread. No, he says, when you, when you get before him, you say, our Father, and then you acknowledge his name. You're Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Sidkanu, and you tell him all you know of him. And that takes time. And that's the proper way to approach the king of kings. I said to you before, this is why we dress up on Sunday morning. They, what, you know, churches do whatever they want to do. But we believe if you're coming before royalty, you put on your best. Don't shout. Not to look at each other, but to look at his face. And so that he can, uh, he can accept us, even with our dress wear. It's not, it's not just for banquets, special occasions. You don't put on your best to banquets and presidents. You put on your best to come before royalty. Yeah, you might as well say amen. It's the truth. So I want you to think about it. All of a sudden, this woman did the right thing. She approached him correctly, and when she did, she got his attention. She didn't get it the first time, but she just came and said, 
this is what I want. So when you go into your prayer closet, you don't just tell God what you want. You approach him with worship. Sing a song. <laughs> Talk about his goodness. Talk about how great he is. Tell him who he is to you. You say all these things, take a few moments to do that. That takes some time. And this is why many of our, believe, our Christians, they, they, can't spend, they can't even spend an hour in the presence of God because they, they run out of things to say. You know why? Because they keep asking for stuff. If I was to take a survey of your prayer in the last month, 90% of what you've been praying is asking. You look so sad. This is supposed to be a good message now. Huh? Well, think about it. So when you get in, the, when you get in the, the closet, when you get in that place, you worship him, you talk about his goodness, who he is to you, what he is to you, and you spend a few moments exalting him and speaking of his goodness. Hallowed be thy name. That's what that means. They said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, O Lord, in my house as it is in heaven. And then when you get ready to leave that closet, you walk out and say, oh, by the way, give us this day our daily bread. In other words, now you present your request. Forgive us of our death as we forgive those trespassing. And all of a sudden, you get his attention. She got his attention. And she got her answer because of her approach. I can go on for a while, but just go to one more passage, if you would, the ninth chapter, chapter 9. Am I helping you this morning? All right, look in the ninth chapter. And at ninth chapter and verse 18, I've, I've just, just about five minutes left. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30, 40, 40 something, something, something like that. Yeah. Now, it won't be long. But you're getting this, right? All right, if you look, go back to the ninth chapter and look at the beginning of verse 18, it says, watch this. This is important now, watch, watch. He says, while he spoke these things to them. In other words, Jesus was teaching. Can you, can you imagine that? He said, he's speaking something to them. While he spoke these things to them, behold, that means, look, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, my daughter has just died, but come, lay your hands on her, and she will live. Jesus arose and followed him, and so, his, and so did his disciples. We stop there. The emphasis in the middle of his preaching, in the middle of his teaching, somebody came, not just made a request, he came and worshiped him and then made his request. In the middle of his teaching, he stopped because he got his attention. In the middle of his teaching, he stopped and followed him. Can you see that? Why? Because he approached him correctly. Got his attention immediately. Stopped. We don't always have to finish our message. I said we don't always have to finish our message. I don't have to finish this. You know why? Because I hear the Holy Ghost. You know, Paul, Paul went in, in, in uh, um, it was Peter, Acts the 10th chapter, went to Cornelius' house. It says, while he yet spoke these things, the Holy Ghost fell. Interrupted his message. That's what God did right now. I'm done. Stand up. While he yet spoke these things, the Holy Ghost fell. Fill him with the Holy Ghost in the middle of his message. We don't have to finish. Not if you're going to follow the Holy Ghost. Not if you follow God, you don't have to finish. It ain't about us anyway. It's about what he says. Do yourself a favor, though. I want you to notify somebody that's saved already about what happened tonight. 
You say, well, I ain't got nobody I can call. You can call us. We don't know you, but we want to get to know you. Call us, write us. Let us know what happened. Let us pray for you. Let us give you a little instructions about the things that's probably going to happen in the near future. And let us tell you about this path and this journey that you're on. You made the most quality decision tonight that you will ever make in your life. And it's an eternal decision. We love you and we're here for you. And we are praying for you. God bless you. And we look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning. Thank you for joining us for the service today. We pray that the message was a blessing to your life. We also pray that you consider sowing a financial seed into the ministry to allow us to continue to spread this gospel. Thank you once again. Your seed may leave your hand, but it will never leave your life.